Hello and welcome to Echo at Africa, our new show that talks about the environment and innovations in green technologies. Here's what we have coming up for you. We head out in search of a tiny bird, tiny but strong enough to cross the Atlantic called the Benin Waxbill. They might be tiny, but Sahara dust particles do have a great impact on our climate. New trends, how tourists are becoming trash collectors, and then the ongoing effects of all pollution in Nigeria's Ogoni land. Welcome to Echo Africa, I'm Neo Taiwe. The small West African country of Benin is a regular paradise for bird watchers and birds themselves, of course. In contrast to neighboring Nigeria, where oil extraction has destroyed many natural habitats, Benin's countryside remains largely untouched. And that's good news for these two French ornithologists, or bird experts if you prefer, who have made it their mission to track down a rare and tiny bird that is threatened with extinction. Julien Gonin is traveling on the Zoo River in southern Benin. He's an ornithologist and looking for a particular species of bird. Bonjour, bonjour. Together with his colleague, Fabien Massier. We're going to the place where I spotted the Anambra waxbill for the first time four years ago. I didn't expect it here at all, but there it was. I was really surprised to see that bird here. I immediately opened my book and it was the right one. But according to the map, it shouldn't even be here. It was a really special feeling for me. Julien spent four years collecting money and preparing their project. Now there's a lot at stake for them. Will they find the bird? And if so, how many of them? To the locals, like Laurent Okiga, the European scientists are exotic. I find it amazing that this white man has made such a long journey just for a bird. He came from so far away just to see a bird. I find that pretty strange. But it's not just one. There are indeed plenty of them. The next day, Julien and Fabien catch 25 birds in their nets, and they now remove them as carefully as possible. <laughs> I'm shaking. It's the first time I've held one of these birds in my hand. It's very emotional, catching my first wax bill in Benin. It's an adult. Wonderful. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. I picked these red sacks because they match the red beaks. <laughs> Have these birds flown over from Nigeria, where they're in danger of extinction, or are they native here? It's not yet clear, but measuring the beaks and comparing them to those of their Nigerian relatives should get them some answers. What is certain now, in any case, is that this rare and shy bird does indeed live here. And these are the first moving images of it ever recorded. From tiny birds to a sprawling desert, have you ever wondered what effects our dust particles have on our environment? It might come as a surprise to you, but even the most minute particles can influence climate change. Every year, some five billion tons of minute particles are absorbed into the air around us. Around half comprises desert dust. These tiny specks are between a hundred and a thousand times thinner than a human hair. The greatest producer of desert dust is the Sahara in North Africa. It's 26 times the size of Germany and is the largest hot desert in the world. So does the Sahara dust have an impact on the global climate? Storms carry the dust particles up to seven kilometers high. The air currents there then pull them west and over the Atlantic. The light-colored sand reflects and scatters sunlight, meaning that only part of the sun's radiation manages to reach the ground. That results in less heat stored in forests, lakes, rivers, and oceans, and less returned to the air. The particles also have an effect on rainfall. 
Researchers have determined that the amount of water in clouds decreases as the amount of dust in the air increases. Most of the particles from the Sahara eventually descend over the Atlantic. At the equator, the drizzle of dust fertilizes the surface of the ocean with iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen. These minerals stimulate the growth of tiny marine plants. That in turn increases the ocean's ability to absorb and neutralize CO2 and other greenhouse gases from the air. Some of the dust makes it as far as South America. More than half of the minerals and other nutrients found in the Amazon rainforest, in fact, hail from the Sahara. These natural fertilizers are vital for the health of the rainforests and their capacity for absorbing CO2 from the air. The Sahara may be a hostile environment, but in the bigger picture, it's a life-saving source of nutrients. So how often have you heard that when you see a problem, you should fix it? Marius Smith did just that. He was tired of seeing plastic waste polluting the canals of Amsterdam and decided to do something about it. He didn't know that his idea could turn into a thriving business, one that turned trash into something useful. And guess what? It turned out to be fun too. Cruising the canals of Amsterdam. But Marius Smit isn't sightseeing, he's fishing. Fishing plastic waste from the water, that is. The stuff is everywhere. Bottles. Different kind of foam. Plastic bag. It makes me sad if you see spots like this, just so much waste. I mean, how, how does it, how this, this end up in a canal, you know? It's, it boggles me, actually. The city's canals are a tourist magnet. But wherever there's a lot of people, there's also a lot of rubbish. That's why Smit founded Plastic Whale, a company dedicated to fishing plastic waste from the canals. It's the first of its kind. Yeah, my kid find it strange, of course, because normally dads work at the bank or uh, have a normal job and their dad is, uh, is a plastic fisherman. So just recently, my six-year-old asked me, what in God's name are you doing all day, pa, uh, daddy? And it feels strange to tell him that I am actually fishing plastic out of the water. But he's passionate about what he does, and this enthusiasm rubs off on others. Mario Smith now has 20 employees. It's good for tourism, because people will say, it's a clean city. So, it's not only the environmental aspect of, of, of the job, but also really the aesthetics. I'm really proud to do this. Yeah, so I, I tell people all the time, and <laughs> it's my favorite pastime, I guess. But the company doesn't just collect plastic waste from the water, it recycles it. And turns it into boats. Their very own boat is made of plastic waste from Amsterdam. At first glance, this is all just dirty rubbish. But plastic waste also makes great material for constructing boats. It's light, robust, and stays afloat. People, when they see our boats, they need to touch it because they want to see how we actually make a boat from plastic waste. They never actually believe it, but uh, yeah, the, the, like I said, the, the process by itself is not that difficult. Here in the company office, Smith explains how the recycling process works. So this is a typical PET bottle that we use, or that we fish from the canals. And then it goes through a process of shreddering and washing process. A number of projects. Uh, and eventually it becomes small granules of plastic. And from these granules, uh, we make these foam plates. And they look like this. Um, and these foam plates we use as basic material for the boats. So they form the basis of the, uh, the whole boat. 
He's already built three boats from plastic waste and is planning three more. Smith's business idea is inspiring others. Companies have started to book canal cruises with plastic whale. Fishing for plastic waste has become cool. Company outings are the firm's main source of income. Last year, it conducted almost 30 canal tours. Mario Smith is able to make a living off plastic waste. Well, in our society, we need to change the perception of plastic. Um, you buy a product, you unwrap it, you throw away the plastic, and it's gone. And if people value plastics differently, so they see that plastics should not be seen as waste, but as a raw material, people are treating uh, plastic also differently. And then he hopes people won't throw it into canals anymore. Many around the world are working to increase their awareness of the need for conservation efforts, particularly in the face of climate change. Perhaps you're one of them. If so, you can share your story with us and take part in our Doing Your Bit campaign that showcases projects and efforts from all corners of the globe. This one in Malawi is encouraging the use of fuel-efficient cook stoves. In Malawi, 95% of the population uses wood or charcoal for cooking because it's cheap. But this causes massive deforestation. Additionally, the smoke causes breathing problems, and children often suffer burns. Jeff Ferber is the founder of the charity Ripple Africa. He promotes the use of fuel-efficient cook stoves. Mud can be turned into bricks, and bricks into stoves in just one hour. This reduces wood use by 67%. It also makes cooking faster and easier. We like that. Are you also doing your bit? Tell us about it. Visit us at dw.com slash doing your bit or get in touch on Twitter. Doing your bit. We share your stories. Did you know that your cell phone contains valuable metals such as copper, gold, and silver? And if you have old cell phones lying around your house, say about 15,000 of them at least, then it could be that you're sitting on a gold mine. Of course, you'll need to find a way to extract these metals. It's called urban mining. That's exactly what the German company Arbis is doing. They are major recyclers of copper and other raw materials. We visited the company in Hamburg to find out more. Here at Arubis, they're recycling two tons of cell phones. Some of them real relics from the dawn of the industry. For production chief Detlev Laze, the vintage models are merely a source of raw materials. A phone like this is made up of 10 to 15 percent copper, but if you take a look at the contacts, you can see there's gold too. A ton of phones contains up to 300 grams of gold, plus two to two and a half kilos of silver. That's what interests us. If you break it down into the precious metals and other valuable parts, it's worth some nine to 10,000 euros. The company recycles all sorts of electronics, including computers, TVs, and mobile phones, for their lucrative components. It's our source of metal. We don't have mines or mineral deposits. For us, it's urban mining. We extract the metals needed for our economy, for our industry, and make them re-available for production processes.
The problem is that very few consumers know how valuable their used cell phones actually are. A number of companies have now sprung up, offering people cash for their old cell phones. This firm buys up around 8,000 units a month. In some cases, the phones are just months old. The company's dealings with customers take place entirely on the Internet. Customers get an estimate for their phone online. A relatively new smartphone is worth between two and 300 euros. If the device still works, the data is wiped and the device is refurbished and sold to a new owner. A sales transaction on our website takes three to four minutes. All you need to do is package the phone and mail it free of charge. We transfer the money within seven days. And it's a far more dependable option than the online auction sites where you never know what's going to happen. The average household in Germany has two or three old phones gathering dust. The financial incentive means more of them are now finding their way back into circulation. And if they can't be used anymore for their original purpose, they're likely to end up at Arubis. It's the only company in Germany that melts down shredded phones to produce raw copper. Copper has never been so much in demand on the world markets or so expensive. And that demand would be difficult, if not impossible, to meet without recycling electronic scrap. Arubis processes around a million tons of copper per year. That's an anode with a copper content of around 98%. There's also all the base metals like nickel and lead, plus the precious metals gold, silver and palladium. We then extract and refine pure copper via electrolysis. Electrolysis is the final step in the recycling process. The metal is placed in a bath of sulfuric acid and a powerful electric current is passed through it. The result? Sheets of copper with a purity of 99.9%. Mobility is on the cusp of a new era in Germany, or at least that's what we keep hearing. The goal is to see a million electric cars on German roads. It might sound ambitious, but it is a future. It is not, however, the present reality, partly perhaps because owning a car in a big city can be inconvenient. In Berlin, for instance, a new company is not betting on electric cars, but electric scooters. Our reporter took one for a test drive. The only thing louder than its motor is the bright red paint. The EMEO company's electric scooters can now be rented in Berlin. They carry riders around town and through traffic jams silently and ecologically at up to 45 kilometers per hour. EMEO is a new Berlin startup for e-scooter sharing. They've purchased 150 e-scooters that will be hitting the German capital streets. The batteries can be removed and recharged from an electrical outlet. No need for a dedicated charging station. The scooter carries two batteries. They look like this. Each one has a 50-kilometer range, or 100 kilometers in total. The scooter's designed for driving around the city 7 to 10 kilometers at a time, so there's a lot you can do with it. Customers can rent an e-scooter from wherever they happen to be. A cell phone app locates the nearest available scooter and activates it. The luggage box contains the keys and two helmets, a large and a small. It's a quick and easy alternative for getting around town. Another option is the e-bike, a bicycle with a built-in electric motor that kicks in when the rider steps on the pedals. It's a big plus for commuters. They can travel on an e-bike at up to 30 kilometers per hour. No sweat. But the big minus is the high price. 
Soll ich anrufen? Alles klar, dann rufe ich sie an. So the Berlin company, E-Bike Finder, developed a leasing concept, much like the ones companies use to lease cars. <lacht> On eBike Finder's homepage, a company's employees can choose from over 20 models. Leasing rates range from 30 to 90 euros a month. Dann sehen Sie die wichtigsten Daten. Es findet schon in Einstellung. There's been a change of attitude among the employers. They know we've got many snarled streets and few parking spots. And we've got employees looking for ways to move around a little. Can we find one solution for all that together? Well, lots of people ride bicycles and we need more bike racks. Why not combine that with a really practical electromobility? In other words, an e-bike. The days when electric bikes were something for senior citizens are over. Now e-bikes look much like conventional bicycles. The batteries are integrated into the frame. The models range from racing to mountain bikes. Sales approach half a million per year in Germany, even with prices averaging some 2,000 euros. The most expensive models cost as much as a compact car. Electric vehicles of all sorts are also popular with tourists in Berlin. At the Brandenburg Gate, they can book a jaunt around the city on an electric tuk-tuk. Nigerian Ken Sao Weaver was executed 20 years ago on November the 10, 1995. A civil rights activist and environmentalist fought for years against shell oil, whose oil production activities caused destruction in his native region. Sao Weaver was executed for his efforts by the former military government. Ogoni land, his home, still suffers from one of the largest environmental disasters in history. Our correspondent visited the region. Once again here in Bodo, Nigeria, the fishermen's nets come out empty. Sinabari Bonwa has to paddle for hours every day if he wants to catch anything. That's the result of thousands of barrels of oil seeping into the water in 2008 and 2009 from a shell oil pipeline. Because of the oil spill from Shell's pipeline, there is very little to catch around here. It destroyed the ecosystem. There used to be oysters, but those days are gone. A community representative says Shell paid out $83 million in compensation in early 2015. But very few people benefited from that money. And now hardly anyone here has work. We have not been in good terms with them over the years because uh, they have neglected the communities, most especially the border community and other communities in Uganda where the facilities are. Where you have, they don't maintain the facilities, they neglect the community, they look for a way to, start, to corner a group of, uh, say, community leaders or representatives and um, give them one or two stipend and they report. A few kilometers away, we visit the grave of Ken Sarawiwa with his brother, Harry. For years, Ken Sarawiwa fought on behalf of the residents of Ogoniland, demanding a share of the oil revenues and calling for more human rights and environmental protection. Twenty years ago, the military executed him and other activists despite international protests. His brother, Harry, believes Shell was partly responsible. I believe that it sacrifices life for everybody. And people, people may say it's not worth it because what have the people got or have the people gotten? <laughs> but all the things we kept down are coming to pass, one after the other. It took us time, but finally everybody saw that Ken was speaking the truth. You can see that he died for speaking the truth. Experts say it'll take 30 years to reverse the damage caused by the leaked oil, at a cost of a billion euros. Shell is reluctant to talk about the disaster that occurred in Agoniland. Both the oil company and the new Nigerian government have pledged to remove the toxins from the environment, but they still haven't put forward any concrete plans. And we are working with the government to commence that uh, implementation as quickly as possible. So those are the things we are looking at, how we can really help to be part of the solution you know, of those problems. 
Sinabari Bonwa doesn't believe there will be a quick solution. He says the environment has been destroyed and society divided into winners and losers. For him, one thing is clear. The oil in Agoniland is more of a curse than a blessing. That curse, as he puts it, has led to a new case being brought against Shell. Two communities in Nigeria's Niger Delta region say oil activities have left them with neither fresh water nor sufficient fish stocks. Their lawsuit is unlikely to be the last. That's it for our first Ecuador Africa show. I hope you enjoyed the program. For more on our environmental coverage, do visit our website showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Neil Taigui. Bye-bye.